Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another short episode of my little series here on uh, bait selection and techniques. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about catching giant bass on big baits. And, um, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of um, what I normally, the methodology behind the selections and, and what I'm doing when I'm hunting for just big fish is... Um, Number one is I'm hoping for a uh, feeding window. Um, you know, when they're really finicky and it's and it's difficult to catch uh, fish in general, be it large or small, um, I scale down in size. But there are times during the day and you know during the week, uh, depending on what the weather's doing, um, when they'll really uh, you know when they'll when they'll eat when they're chewing, and uh, I capitalize on those times uh, by throwing large baits. Also, if I'm in a situation where I'm fishing a tournament and I have, you know, five keepers in the live well, <clears throat> I always have rods uh, set aside with big fish baits, you know, uh, jigs that have a real full profile um, with the full skirt, uh, with the big trailer or, or big worms or, or what have you. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm on a shad pattern, I'll throw a big fluke, you know, and I think a lot of times kind of my theory behind the whole thing is is that um, when we're catching and releasing fish we're we're not culling uh, you know any any uh, pond management company or small lake management company that you hire is going to come to your house or your farm or what have you and they're going to say hey you need to keep this many fish and you need to cull this many fish and and there will be a certain pound allotment of forage and it's very uh, precise in the way that they uh, divide up the categories within your lake or pond and how everything should be balanced. Um, so we're creating an artificial environment uh, in the lakes and ponds and, and uh, not necessarily ponds but the lakes and rivers um, when we're fishing and we're releasing fish. Uh, so what's happening is is there's a lot of small fish swimming around in, in, in you know certain lakes. Uh, for example, uh, Canyon Lake, where I live in San Antonio area, um, uh, it's uh, you know absolutely there's a there's a large population, and so there's a lot of little fish swimming around, and so percentage percentage you know would dictate percentage odds would dictate that you know you throw out a bait and you know your chances of catching a small fish are high because there's so many little ones. Um, so we keep releasing these little ones back into the environment, and they live because of catch and release, which is great. Um, but what happens is, is that it, you know, analogous to the way in which you'd have a uh, a bag of marbles, and you reach in for a red marble, um, but you instead get get a blue marble, and you reach in again another blue marble, and you're like, gosh, you know, there's red marbles in here, I can't get to them. Well, there's so many blue marbles that there's no way to get to the red ones, and your chances of getting to them are so small. So um, a lot of the a lot of times, um, you know, people might argue that it has to do with seasonality and picking the right locations on the lake to fish for bigger fish, or keying into a specific pattern. You know, really dialing in your pattern and being able to catch those big bites um, and draw those big strikes. But I would also add to that list. Um, one of the most critical uh, things which is you know fishing big baits because essentially what you're doing is you're creating a filter and you're basically putting like a mesh inside of that uh, that bag that that analogy I used about that uh, about that that sack of marbles and you're filtering out you know the blue ones um, or you know versus the red ones so you're, you're selecting for the red ones and a lot of times, you know, there are instances in which small fish will eat a big bait, but the the percentage in which that happens and the frequency with which that happens is not as high, um, you know, than it would be for catching a bigger fish. So I, I absolutely believe in that. There's times when people, you know, like let's just take for example, you're on a lake and <clears throat> there's a a base forage there's there you see a lot of bait clouds swimming around and they're you know a couple inches long and you think okay well everything i've heard and learned has told me to match the hatch there's merit to that and it makes a lot of sense because that's what you're they're used to seeing swim around but um 
you could, uh, you know, make your bait stand out and potentially draw a larger bite by stepping up that size even slightly um, and weeding out some of those smaller fish. There's definitely a mechanical a component. Not only is it a, I think fish make a calculation of the size of the meal and the calorie content of that meal before they decide to expend energy to, to attack it. But there is a, uh, there's a distinction and there's a, uh, a drawing power. There's a mechanical, there's a mechanical component to them actually getting the bait in their mouth versus a bigger one. Um, you know, if I threw like a Magnum fluke, for example, which I have here today, um, you know, I don't think you're going to be catching a whole lot of one pounders on it. Sure. They may bite it and you may hook them. I am not saying that there's not exceptions, but all I'm saying is, is so this is the Magnum fluke. You know, this is, this is giant. So this is a sparkling water can that I have. And, um, you can see the size comparison. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty huge. So these Magnum flukes here, you know, and then also I have huge hands. So you can see how big this bait is. Um, I've got huge hands, but I'll pull out that Magnum fluke. You know, there's been times on Lake Waco, for example, Waco, Texas. Um, I'm on a shad bite. Boom, firing out that Carolina rig in the summertime, the late late summer afternoons. And I'm dragging the Carolina rig, catching little ones, catching little ones, and I tie on this magna fluke and a hammer hits it. And I mean he just clocks it. And it's it just becomes so obvious to me. Um, you're not always gonna get those bites, like I said, when things slow down, but um, but I absolutely think without without doubt I, I i i say it's a theory because i always like to err on the side of caution and i think that everyone should exercise that this is a every day i go out there is a is an experiment and i'm trying to to rework this ball of uh hypotheses that i have and it's something that really makes sense and chip away at it until i get the truth that's every day that i'm out there um but any anyhow um i have a box of of jess magnum flukes and I don't take them out a lot, or I don't. I don't actually pull them out of the box a lot, um, you know, during a normal day of fishing. So I have them stored in the back of my boat with other baits that I might not use that much, as well as the baits that I have hand selected for my clients. You know, the the baits that are easy to catch fish with, like finesse worms and um, tiny flukes and different things that will get them bites so that they can have a good time and and you know I'm not struggling to put them on fish you know there's there's days when it's difficult and you have to adjust and I've learned that sequestering these baits in a way that makes it easily accessible for my client giving them their own tackle box with all their weights all their stuff it helps immensely so nevertheless I put these baits these baits that I don't use much back there with it and, and in case I need it I'll go back there and grab them but I have all these different colors, you know, of uh, flukes, the same colors, as a matter of fact, that I have for my normal fluke selection. You know, I've got a uh, kind of like a pearlescent green back type big fluke here. I've got the traditional pearl. Um, I've got like a white ice. You know, that's a great one. It's got a little bit of a flash to it. I don't know if you could see it, but it does. Um, you know, I've got a smoking shad color. And I've got my favorite color, which is an albino fluke. And I can catch fish on anywhere in the country with that color. It's just, it works in clear water and dirty water. It's awesome. Um, but nevertheless, I keep those in there. And I know when I get that fifth fish in the live well, unless I'm just catching big ones and it just happens to be my day, um, you know, I'll try to swing the odds in my favor and throw these bigger baits. Um, you know, sometimes I'll just Texas rig them with no weight work it on top, twitch it on top, kind of like a top water, um, and just get it to kind of dart, you know, very erratically. I'll throw it like that. A lot of times I'll throw it out with a heavier gauge um, hook so that it has a little bit more of a quicker fall rate. And I'll also scale back the pound test that I use and use a lighter pound test so that it sinks quicker um, and keep it down in the strike zone in case they're suspended off the bottom a fair amount, but they're not exactly on the top of the surface feeding somewhere in between. Um, I do little tricks like that. Like I said, I throw it on a Carolina rig. The places that I throw these flukes, you know, I also um, throw it on a jig head periodically, and I'll change the um, weight of the jig head to keep it where I want in the water column and make it responsive in the fashion that I want whenever I twitch the bait, how hard that it darts, if it spirals on the way down. I'll play with the weight in order to accommodate my needs on that specific day based on what I think the fish are doing. Um... <clears throat> 
<clears throat> my next group of baits that are large baits, this is my big worms. And I have massive big worms. I don't mean just little worms that are kind of big. I mean big. So these are shaky head worms, for example. These are shaky head worms. I told you guys my hands were huge. Okay, these, and this is the can of sparkling water. These things are freaking massive. Okay, I have one shaky head worm in like this green pumpkin and one uh, in this color, like this red bug. Um, obviously, I have more than one of each, but I'm just showing you what I have in my hands at the moment. Um, and man, all I can say is, like, I came home from Waco one year and started working construction and doing other things besides just guiding. And I, I got, you know, I was like, man, I got to get on the water. I want to do some tests. I want to run some experiments and figure some things out. And I said, I'm only throwing big baits for the next month. That's it. I'm not picking up anything else. And I will live and die by these big baits. And the first day, the first day that I went out on Canyon Lake, I caught a big fish doing that. And I threw out this huge red bug, shaky head worm, on like a massive shaky head weight, you know, um, hook weight setup, and um, it's like boom immediately. You know, I was, I was, it was actually during the winter too, when everybody thinks, oh, you need to scale back on your size, throw little baits, work it really slow. There, there's merit to that, absolutely. You know, people say these things because they, they resonate and they, and they, they seem to prove true most of the time, but. I'm telling you guys, when there's a feeding window, you know, especially on the warming trends during the winter time, when there's activity and they decide to, to start getting at it and eating, I mean, you can throw these big baits and you can catch some quality fish. So for Canyon, you know, there's a lot of one pounders swimming around. I've caught some good fish on Canyon, but, um, but there are, there's some smaller fish swimming around. So just to kind of show you I wanted to bring up this picture that I remember that I had on my website. I don't have all my pictures of fish that I've caught or clients or any of that on my website. I have a few. Um, so, but if I go to my web page here, <clears throat> no, sorry, gallery, and I kind of scroll down. So this one right here, this fish right here was in the middle of winter. I had my full snowsuit on. It was freaking cold. And I'm thinking, okay, I need to slow down, scale back, and all that, but no. It's about big baits and capitalizing on that bite window when they're active for that brief snapshot of time during the day or week. And, you know, I caught that fish, this fish right here, I caught it on this worm. Boom. And this worm's huge. I wish I had a better, um, a better metric to compare this against so that you guys can really get an idea. But I know that from here to here is nine inches. And it's pretty damn close to, you know, it's it's pretty stout. It may be a little bit more than that. I don't know. Um, but it's freaking stout. And also it's fat. That's another thing. It doesn't just have to be the length of the bait. It's also the fullness of it. And like I said, I do believe that that, that makes sense. And that, that's, uh, you know, that blends nicely. It, it, it fits my narrative on... Um, you know, catching fish that are bigger is you, you just, you know, you, you widen it a little bit and it's about the, the metabolic calculation that these fish make. And I don't think that that's like a wacky idea. I 100% think that even if it's flashing past their face, you know, really getting a good long look at it, I think they make a calculation of, okay, this is this many calories roughly. This is how long it's going to take me. This is going to how how much energy I'm going to have to expend to get this bait, you know? And so... It could just be like I have small little finesse worms in the garage that are my normal like four inch uh, zoom finesse worm, you know, whatever, like the little one. And I have the zoom fat finesse worm, which is the same length but thicker in the body and has more fullness. And I absolutely catch bigger fish on the zoom fat finesse worm. So when I'm trying to, you know, slow down and be more methodical, fish for fish that aren't necessarily chewing. Um, but wanting to catch that little big, bigger caliber, uh, caliber fish, that's what I'll throw. Um, I've also got huge ribbon tail worms. Um, like I've got this one in a plum color. This is a big one. I think this is the Zoom Old Monster. I could be not correct, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, and I threw that in like uh, Lake Falcon. 
you know, I used to go off the bank with my buddy in college, just go off the bank and just wade in the water and catch freaking studs, studs throwing these baits, you know, and it's just amazing. It used to be like super killer out there. I'm sure it's still good, but I don't know if it is what it used to be. So this one right here is a freaking Goliath. If you look at this, this is the old monster. This is a tank of a, of a worm right here, but this one's a freaking beast. Much bigger than that. It's got at least a few more inches on it. It's it's thick. It's like throwing a piece of like steel rope out there. I mean, this thing's a freaking hoss. It moves a lot of water, you know, and, and normally people don't throw this stuff. It's amazing. Okay, this is the most amazing thing about the whole deal to me. These people, and I've done it too, you decide that you're going to take a trip to Mexico to go fish a trophy lake. And what do you do? You don't go to the tackle store and buy a whole bunch of finesse worms and small baits and, and oh, I'm going to go get a bunch of bites. You go in there with the mental like image of what you see online, all the big catches, all these monster bass, and you say, you know what? I'm throwing freaking huge baits. You go get massive swim baits. You go get massive magnum sinkos. You go get huge worms like this worm right here that's like for, I don't even know if, what this would catch. You know, you go get all these big worms and you go there fully expecting to get that big bite. And what happens? You get that big bite and you get it multiple times. Yes, the fish are happen to be probably more active there because of the growth season and the climate. And just, I think a lot of times that that voracious bite is is unique to those Southern hemisphere or it's, it's the Southern, it's more Southern hemispherical than necessarily, you know, like a North Texas or a, uh, you know, like a, I don't know, Lake Arkansas and Arkansas or something, these lakes have longer growth seasons. Everything's always on it. The water temperature's solid. Everything's just gorging. And, you know, it's it's all about that mental state. So we go out there with these huge baits, 25-pound freaking fluorocarbon, 65-pound braid, and we're throwing huge hooks and all this stuff. And what happens, like I said, we catch these big fish. So I don't necessarily think that's the way to go about fishing, you know, here uh, in a normal lake where there's a ton of little fish swimming around and, um, you know, you're fishing, there's a lot of tournament pressure and all these other things. I don't think that that's the solution, but I do think that you can add these tools to your repertoire and 100% vault yourself to that next level and start catching trophies. I even have huge rattle traps. I should have brought either rattle traps and the big finesse worms out, but I have rattle traps that are freaking huge. And I did an experiment with those too, and I said, they're eating freaking thread fin. I know they are. I'm throwing this massive rattle trap, and I customized it. It was awesome. I threw this huge rattle trap, and what I did is basically it had a big, heavy chartreuse band on the back. And I took sandpaper and I sanded it and sanded it and sanded it to where it became just a slight hue of chartreuse. And I thought, okay, I'm going to throw this in the clear water. The chartreuse not going to turn them off. It's going to be just that little, that little hint of it, that subtle hint that's a silhouette around the bait. And it should be great for like Canyon Lake. And I threw it out there on the, on the uh, bluff walls. Boom. And it was just stroking it and it was coming up falling down coming up falling down and I caught some freaking biggins and that was at the same time of the year that I was fishing for this fish right here and just saying you know I'm only throwing big baits that's it boom you know but uh, but there's real merit to that there's a hundred percent real merit to that find out the first thing you want to do is find out what the fish are eating and you find that out by what color you're throwing after you find that out, you figure, you ask yourself, what size is the forage? Once you figure out what size it is, the majority of the forage, you can increase the size a little bit, or you can do a lot. It's up to you, but I think it looks most natural, maybe. You know, here I am, I just gave this huge spiel and throwing massive baits. I would say that if you wanted to be cautious, you know, throw baits that are slightly larger than everything that's swimming around to try to get their attention and draw that bigger bite. 
and have that mechanical advantage over the fish and, and everything that I had kind of laid out here. Um, but, uh, but, you know, figure out what size the majority of the stuff is swimming around, figure out what color it is, figure out what level in the lake or the river that they're positioned at and what level everything's swimming around at. Just look at your graph, just drive around and idle around the lake and just keep an eye on where every, all the life is at in the lake and then find your cover around that level. Um, your cover and structure and find your bait fish around that level and everything and that's where you'll find you know your your fish your quality bite um, but um, but I hope that really helps you know I, I think it is logical you know everybody I've heard a lot of people say throw big baits for big bass and big fish but yeah big fish eat a big bait and you're gonna you're gonna filter through a lot of those uh, you know those one and two pounders um, that get released every day and that's another thing you know we release them and I'm all for I am all for conservation I'm 100% on board but when we're not putting an equal amount of focus into stocking these lakes and we just keep releasing these fish there's a base level of forage that's swimming around and you know there's only so much food to go around so I guess what I'm getting at is that I want to eliminate the possibility of catching a whole bunch of little fish. I want to catch bigger fish, so I throw bigger baits, and it seems to work for me. Like I said, I'm always re-articulating my hypothesis and retesting it, going out there and experimenting because that's what it's about. And and you know, you could read a million articles, but until you experience it yourself, you can't really say for sure and you don't have that concrete evidence. Um, but really really do hope that helps that uh that's a that's a piece of gold if you can if you can hold on to that and remember it and utilize it during your tournaments to to catch that big bite you know with an hour left um when you got a full live well it's going to make the difference it's going to pay off it may not immediately but it will and if you just wanted to do the test for yourself that i did the test that i did by going out there and only throwing big baits for one month and spending like considerable time of water on the lake you know just being out there you know, three times a week if you're able to and, and being out there all day and just throwing those damn baits, those big swim baits, everything, throwing them until you're just exhausted and you say, God, I haven't had a bite all day. I want to switch to that little wacky worm or that Nico rig. Forget it. Keep throwing that big bait and you will get that big bite and it's going to be awesome when you do. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, I really try to put the best content I can out there and I believe in what I'm telling you guys. And, and I know it to be true because I've put a lot of hard work into my craft and um, I'm just excited to see how things work out for y'all and I hope there's some big fish in your future. So thanks once again and we'll talk to you soon.